There is no bloody way we're going to move to environmental sustainability on the backs of the poor because they won't have it. If we produce enough economic havoc, which we could easily do, then we'll produce a deterioration back to very short-term thinking and we'll produce an environmental nightmare. So it isn't, can we have human flourishing or zero impact on the planet? It's that if we put the poor under too much stress, which is, first of all, is an absolutely unconscionable thing for rich people to be doing. But if it does, there's going to be a kickback, the likes of which we can hardly imagine. Yeah, yeah. L and let them eat cake. <laughs> well, guess who ate cake? Yeah. <laughs> right, it, right. Off with yeah, the head. Yeah, or zoo animals. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. Because if you make it, you know, if you take a given country and you destroy the economy, you're going to destroy all the animals. Because as soon as people get hungry enough, they're going to eat everything. So we have to manage human beings, so to speak. We, we have to allow human beings to step up the energy density ladder so that they can address their absolute privation, so they can take a longer term view. And there's no environmental solution absent of that, as far as I can tell. Join Jordan Peterson in this enlightening video as he explores the intricate relationship between human flourishing, economic impact, and environmental sustainability. Peterson contends that the key lies in lifting the poor from economic stress, emphasizing that the pursuit of sustainability shouldn't burden the disadvantaged. Delving into the importance of efficiency, Peterson and his guests discuss how modern societies can contribute to global progress by promoting energy efficiency. The conversation touches on the cultural aversion to nuclear power, the scale challenge faced by countries like China, and the impending demographic shifts that shape our world. We've talked about energy, the economy, and the environment. There's another E that's really important here, one of efficiency. And let me, let me just briefly describe that and how I think about efficiency. In the United States, we use about 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy every year, 100 quads. What does that mean to anybody? Nothing. <laughs> that's interestingly enough, it's about a quadrillion BTU is about the same as an exajoule, a term physicists love. That means nothing. Uh, it's about the same as, as a trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Maybe we're getting a little closer into the space. People start to understand. It's a lot of energy, a hundred quads. It come, primary energy comes into our system. We use it for residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation reasons. That's how we use energy. Heat and cool things and move ourselves around, okay? The 100 quads comes in, Jordan, guess what? Only one third of that does useful work. Two thirds of that is wasted. Mostly is heat and other things. It doesn't do anything useful. So we have a lot of low hanging fruit in that space. Even if we could go to 50% does useful work. Think of that, that adds another 17 quads of energy without adding any more primary in. So it's, there's an incredible opportunity here as the world begins to lift itself from poverty and the modern world continues to stay healthy to do more with less. I'm not changing my lifestyle and those who need to change your lifestyle can, but we can all do more with less. We can become a lot more efficient in how we use energy. And that's how we ended our very first film. When you end a film, it's with the last thing you want them to remember was on just personal efficiency things. It's not, it's not rocket science. <laughs> These are simple things we can all do. And I'm not saying, you know, go to austerity measures and turn off your heating in the winter time. Not at all. Quite the opposite. Just simple things we can all do. And so that's a very important piece of this overall equation. And I think the opportunity to waste less as the world begins to modernize is there. It's ripe for the taking. That's one of the things we, the modern societies, can, can transport to evolving, developing and developed and, and, evol and emerging economies is, is efficiency as they gain energy. Yeah, well, it, it makes sense to me that as the developing countries develop, they're going to start with technologies that to some degree we have superseded. Right, so you see this, for example, with China's hyper-reliance on cheap coal, and some of which is provided by the Australia that won't burn coal themselves. Now, I know coal produces a fair bit of particulate matter, but it doesn't really matter where the carbon dioxide is produced because it turns out that we all share the same atmosphere. 
So the Chinese and the Indians in particular, and those are the most populous countries, and the same thing's going to happen in Nigeria at some point because it's going to be the world's most populous country by the year 2100. They're going to step up the energy density ladder, and it, it would make a certain amount of sense that the developed countries, I mean, China can obviously do this to some degree by themselves, are going to turn increasingly to sources of extremely high density, like nuclear sources. But then I see these weird inversions where countries like Germany and states like California have decided, well, the next right thing to do in the progression towards a sustainable economy is to shut down the nuclear reactors. And so, and then in, well, in Germany, they burn hot, they burn late night coal, which is high particulate, high carbon dioxide, as a consequence, at least a partial consequence, of shutting down their nuclear reactors. And so when I see that, I think, well, what the hell's going on? Like, there is no standpoint from which that makes sense. So no, there isn't. what are the impediments? <laughs> what do you think, like, what's the proper pathway forward in your estimation? Yeah. And what are the impediments to that at the moment? Boy, there's a lot here to unpack. I'll try to be brief. We have lignite in Texas. We call it black dirt. You know, it's it's hardly coal. It's not anthracite by any means or other forms of coal. So Germany is has that. They increased their coal production 13% when they shut down their nuclear reactors. And climate scientists were aghast, and they should be. That was crazy. Okay. There's a cultural component to G Germany's fear or aversion to nuclear power. I don't fully understand it. France, on the other hand, about the same size, etc., has a nuclear fleet. They needed it, so they didn't have options, so they built their nuclear fleet. It doesn't make sense. You can't make um, logical sense of that. That's a cultural human thing in Germany and other parts of the world. They're going to change. You're starting to see it. Maybe they'll evolve it with small modular reactors, which they'll think is different, but it's not. It's the same technology. It's fission, <laughs> whether they're, you know, light water reactors or sodium cooled, whatever, pick your favorite. It's still fission, um, but that's fine. You know, if that's what it takes to help mitigate some of that fear, great. Um, you see China building, they're the, China and Russia are building 75% of the world's reactor, nuclear reactors today, just those two countries. And they have a lot more on the books. China gets it. Now they're also growing everything else rapidly. And this is where that completely factual, factually complete comes back in. You will hear, completely factual, China is the leader in solar and wind in the world. They have more than any other country. True. You scale it all down and it's still a trivial part of their total energy consumption. It's just a few percent of the power alone, electricity alone, and electricity is only 20 to 25% of total energy. So this is the scale challenge, Jordan. China has to have it all, and they are going toward dense. Uh, China's energy alone, China's annual energy consumption alone, just that country, is more than all the electricity consumed in the world combined. All the electricity in the world. Okay, so that's a scale challenge. We just have to start to understand the scale. You said it very well. India and China combined are one out of every three people on the planet today. One out of three. Now, getting a little population demography, um, China's birth rates or uh, fertility rates are some of the lowest in the world at 1.2. India is now at 2.1, which is the replacement rate. India has come down to 2.1. Who knew? I didn't. There's a great right. demographer. Shock, a shock. Yes. And a UT Austin guy. And what's been happening since the last 30 years, it, picture this graph. <clears throat> I'm a data guy, <laughs> you know. The bottom is GDP per capita. And this axis is fertility rates. Okay. Right, okay. Right, yeah. So I was what, looking at those the other day. It's incredible. Every large country in the world, over a million people, over, since in the last 30 years, the fertility rates are just plummeting, all of them. And they're moving toward wealth. They're not wealthy, they're moving toward wealth. And so this is a remarkable trend underpinned by energy. Now, there are a lot of people very concerned about this, including China. We, <laughs> this gets philosophical, we define growth as good. If you're not growing, you're dying. What's, China's not growing in population anymore and they don't, they don't bring people in like we do in our countries. So 
they're rolled over, they're, they're seeing their population do this, and how are they going to continue to grow? And how's the world going to grow? What we see in those studies is around 2080, that's not very far away, the world peaks at 10 billion people from our 8.2 today, and it doesn't, it doesn't plateau, it plummets back right, down. Right, right, it right. plummets.